All right, thank you for coming. Let's talk about love. Uh, I did a course once uh, called The History of Love. Uh, it was an honors course, and I thought it was gonna be awesome, but the students got there, and they didn't really want to talk about love. They just wanted to say how awesome it was. Um, so it was a terrible course on love. <laughs> I'm hoping we can do better. I think we will. You can see where we've been. Some wonderful, fascinating discussions that I keep thinking about myself. Um, I'm always looking at the art of thinking and um, just so interesting at how, where it gets deployed or seemingly deployed, uh, but not actually used. Um, we talked there about the medium and the message, McLuhan, et cetera. Art of speaking, um, the nature of language, the art of being alone. It's being solitary and being with others. That was fun. The art of working was an interesting talk and discussion. It's always an interesting discussion. I don't know about the talk. Um, and then the art of creating, uh, which was about the muses, which was just great fun for me. I hope it was somewhat fun for you. Tonight, love. All right, hang on, here we go. The oldest voices we have on love are, well, actually, I wanted to include the Gilgamesh with Gilgamesh and Enkidu's love for each other. But we did that in passages, so I didn't want to go over it again, but I do want to mention it. The oldest story in the world is about the love of a man for another man, uh, Gilgamesh and Enkidu. And it's, it's pretty intense. I mean, it drives Gilgamesh onto the hero's journey when Enkidu dies and it wrecks his world. And some of the most beautiful poetry we still have is about Gilgamesh and Enkidu's love for each other. Sappho, a Greek poet on the Isle of Lesbos. Um, she was probably bisexual, but you know that's where the term lesbian, lesbian comes from. It's probably unfair. Uh, it's probably, um, the term probably arose from her detractors. They were probably envious, frankly, of her poetry. Uh, she started an academy for unmarried women on Mytilene, on Lesbos, and Plato called her the tenth muse. Remember when we talked about the muse, the muses, the nine? So, you know, you need that completion, completion so you're always looking for the tenth muse. Uh, and some people say it was Apollo, but Plato said it was this Greek poet we don't have much from her, uh, mostly fragments, but we do have a few complete poems, and I wanted to read you uh, those. So she was singing out to Aphrodite, as you might imagine. The poet of love is, uh, worships the goddess of love, Aphrodite. Immortal Aphrodite on your intricately brocaded throne, child of Zeus, Weaver of wiles, this I pray. Dear lady, don't crush my heart with pains and sorrows. But come here, if ever before, when you heard my far off cry, you listened and you came, leaving your father's house, yoking your chariot of gold. Then beautiful swift sparrows led you over the black earth from the sky to the middle air, whirling their wings into a blur. Rapidly they came, and you, O oh blessed goddess, a smile on your immortal face, asked what had happened this time. What had happened this time? Why did I call again? And what did I especially desire for myself in my frenzied heart? Who this time am I to persuade to your love, Sappho? Who is doing you wrong? For even if she flees, soon she shall pursue. And if she refuses gifts, soon shall she give them. If she doesn't love you, soon shall she love, even if she's unwilling. Come to me now, once and again, and release me from grueling anxiety. Good description of love. All that my heart longs for, fulfill. And be yourself my ally in love's battle. 
that's what, 2,600 2, years ago? Here's another one. Some say an army of horsemen, some of foot soldiers, some of ships is the fairest thing on the black earth. But I say it is what one loves. It is very easy to make this clear to everyone. For Helen, by far surpassing mortals in beauty, left the best of all husbands and sailed to Troy, mindful of neither her child nor her dear parents, but with one glimpse, she was seduced by Aphrodite. For easily, easily bent and nimbly, and then there's a missing part, which I kind of like. <laughs> we don't have the whole text, so you get these fragments. Has reminded me now of Anactoria, who is not here. I would much prefer to see the lovely way she walks in the radiant glance of her face than the war chariots of the Lydians or their foot soldiers in arms. And then finally, that man to me seems equal to the gods. The man who sits opposite you and close by listens to your sweet voice and your enticing laughter that has indeed stirred up the heart in my breast. For whenever I look at you, even briefly, I can no longer say a single thing, but my tongue is frozen in silence. Instantly, a delicate flame runs beneath my skin. Isn't that nice? A delicate flame runs, I'll stop ruining the poetry. With my eyes, I see nothing. My ears make a whir whirring noise. A cold sweat covers me. Trembling seizes my body. I am greener than grass. Lacking but little of death do I see. Some of the best erotic poetry in the world is right in your Bible. The Song of Songs. Do you know this book? Uh, it's part of the writing section of the Tanakh, the Hebrew, uh, the, the prophets in the, the Torah, the prophets in the writings. So it's in the poetical section, as it should be. Don't know really how to date it. It could be anywhere from 10th century to 2nd century. There, there was even a theory going around for a while in biblical scholarship that it was a bar song that was sung in a bar. That doesn't seem right to me. It's too, too the poetry is too sophisticated for a bar song, unless it's a sophisticated bar, I guess. Um, it may have been connected to a fertility ritual. In fact, it probably was. Um, but it is most definitely erotic poetry. The Bible. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is perfume poured out. Therefore the maidens love you. Draw me after you. Let us make haste. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will exult and rejoice in you. We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. I am black and beautiful, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has gazed on me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Tell me, you whom my soul loves, where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon. For why should I be like one who is veiled besides the, beside the flocks of your companion? You may recognize some of this language. I'm a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valley. Right? As a lily among brambles, so is my love among maidens. As an apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among young men. With great delight I sat in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his, his intention toward me was love. Sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. Oh, that his left hand were under my head, and that his right hand embraced me. That's probably a euphemism in Hebrew for sexual stimulation. I slept, but my heart was awake. Listen, my beloved is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is wet with dew. 
my locks with drops of the night. I had put off my garment, how could I put it on again? I had bathed my feet, how could I soil them? My beloved thrust his hand into the opening, and my inmost being yearned for him. This is a Bible, did I mention that? <laughs> I rose to my beloved, my hands dripped with myrrh, and my fingers with liquid myrrh upon the handles of the bolt. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned and gone. How fair and pleasant you are, O loved one, delectable maiden. So this is a kind of dialogue. They're kind of singing back and forth to each other. You are stately as a palm tree, and your breasts are like its clusters. I say, I will climb that palm tree and lay hold of its branches. And may your breasts be like the clusters of the vine and the scent of your breath like apples. And your kisses like the best wine that goes down smoothly, gliding over lips and teeth. I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. The Bible. <laughs> now, um, we don't often get to talk about pre-Socratics here, but they are a really interesting group of philosophers, uh, especially this dude, Empedocles. Pre-Socratic, 490 to 430, he was a physician, a philosopher, a poet. In fact, what we have of his writings, which is usually through other writers quoting him, is in verse. So this is back when philosophy was written in verse. Right? Lucretius is like that, right, David Orr? Yep. yep. Uh, he, he talks about and argues for it. I think this is brilliant. He talks about four elements earth, air, fire, and water, which you've probably heard of. Uh, this is the first person to say that. But it's not just enough to have the four elements, because the four elements obviously relate. So you've got your nouns, now you need your verbs. The verbs are love and strife, two forces in the universe. Love connects, strife disconnects or, or disperses. This is really interesting, right? Here's what he says. I shall tell you a twofold tale. At one time, it grew to be one only out of many. At another, so he's talking about this eternal process of coming together and expanding back out, coming into unity, uh, expanding into diversity or multiplicity. At one time, it grew to be one out of many. At another, it divided up to be many instead of one. There is a double becoming of perishable things and a double passing away. So in that process, there's it. here's the becoming, here's the passing away, here's the becoming, right? And he goes into great detail at each stage of this that I won't read to you. But uh, the coming together of all things brings one generation into being and destroys it. The other grows up and is scattered as things become divided. And these things never cease continually changing places. At one time, all uniting in one through love. At another, each born in different directions by the repulsion of strife. That's pretty cool, right? Um, I think that's similar to physics, some cosmological theories. I think there are elements of Hinduism that we could recognize there, Hindu cosmology. Really interesting stuff. The most famous philosophical statement on love is Plato's, in Plato's Symposium. Uh, really interesting, it's a symposium. We have a symposium here in the fall and spring. It means simply to drink together, but not just drink, because you know when you drink, um, you end up talking and you end up philosophizing. Uh, so that's actually an ancient ritual in Greece uh, that produced a lot of interesting ideas and not a few hangovers. Um, so these gentlemen are sitting around, and of course Socrates is in the middle, and the, the discussion turns to what is love. Phaedrus says love is a, born, is a god born to chaos and earth. So you remember uh, your Hesiod uh, Theogony, uh, Uranus and Gaia at the beginning. Um, merge and, and create the world. 
uh, and apparently, according to Phaedrus, create love. Pausanias uh, talks about heavenly and earthly love, um, which you know we may be familiar with, but it's a little different for him. He's he's talking about the pure love, the heavenly love being male to male, and the earthly love being male to female. Eryx, Eryximachus, he agrees with Pausanias and uh, even extends his argument. And then we get to the really interesting part, the one that people quote and remember from the symposium, and that is Aristophanes. And Aristophanes tells a story. Let me tell you the story. Original human beings, the first human beings, the first ones of us, were born with two faces, four arms, and four legs. But we were cut in two by Zeus because we were arrogant and disobedient. That sound familiar? The gods are always punishing us for being too godlike. Right? Since then, people go walking around the world seeking their missing half. This is actually where the phrase comes from, from Plato's Symposium. Eros, the god of love, is here to assist us in finding this miss, missing half, who is our spiritual kin. Now, it's not, this is interesting, originally there were three genders of human beings. Uh, there were male, female, and androgynous, or hermaphroditic. So, the males were descended from the sun, the females from the earth, the androgynes from the moon. Thus, Eris' task is to make our species happy again through the completion of these two halves and therefore regression to our original state. Uh, it's not easy, though, because when Zeus cut people in half, they were first uh, cut in half in a way that they could not sexually merge and therefore reproduce. They were just able to kiss and hug. <laughs> <laughs> which sounds like a punishment, but, um, and then they died off, so they were gone. Again, we see this theme in world mythology a lot, right? That human, the creation of human beings is, is a series of mistakes, <laughs> right? Uh, for this reason, Zeus sees the problem and he gives us sex organs. And so the sexual organs uh, enabled to have the, your better half your, or your other half to merge and at least for a little while, release the tension of feeling incomplete. Isn't that interesting? Um, so you've got Agathon too, who, who fought, has to follow Aristophanes. And he says, love is the source of all virtue. And everybody says, no, nah, let's hear more from Aristophanes. <laughs> about, no, they didn't say it, but yeah, it's kind of boring. Uh, and then Socrates comes in, and this is interesting because Socrates cannot ever appear to know anything uh, because he's already said he's the wisest man in the world because he knows he knows nothing. So he can never say, well, actually, here's what love is or here's what justice is. He just simply questions people and then until they come to his position. It's genius. Actually, I would love for Socrates to be on cable news. I would pay good money to watch that. Um, so, so I'm going to get to I'm going to get to Socrates in the next slide. I want to skip to Alcibiades, and this is from the symposium. I just want to read it to you. When Socrates had done speaking, the company applauded, and Aristophanes was beginning to say something in answer to Socrates, when suddenly there was a great knocking on the door of the house, as of revelers, partiers, and the sound of the flute girl was heard. What? Agathon told the attendants to go and see who were the intruders. If they are friends of ours, invite them in. But if not, say that the drinking is over. We have no more wine. A little while afterwards, they heard the voice of Alcibiades resounding in the court. He was in a great state of intoxication and kept roaring and shouting, Where is Agathon? Lead me to Agathon. 
and at length, supported by the flute girl and some of his attendants, he found his way to them. Hail, friends, he said, appearing at the door with a massive garland of ivory and violets, his head flowing in ribands or ribbons. Will you have a very drunken man as a companion to your revels? Or shall I crown Agathon, which was my intention in coming and go away? He's in love with Agathon. For I was unable to come yesterday, and therefore I'm here today, carrying on my head these ribbons. Taking them from my own head, I may crown the head of the fairest and wisest of men, as I may be allowed to call him. Would you laugh at me because I'm drunk? Yet I know very well that I'm speaking the truth, although you may laugh. But first tell me, if I come in, shall we have the understanding of which I spoke? Will you drink with me or not? This sound like any other figure you may know from Greek mythology? This is Dionysus. Dionysus is being represented in this discussion on love, and he has nothing to say except, I'm here. <laughs> you know, I'm drunk. <laughs> I'm awesome. That's Dionysus. And let me tell you who the fairest of you all are. And of course, he, he's actually in love with Socrates. He doesn't know Socrates is there, and it's a great scene. Stephen, you should film this scene sometime where he, he's talking about Agathon, and he's, you know, Agathon's all right, but he's no Socrates, and he sees Socrates, and he just trembles and falls apart because that's the one he's really there to see. That's the one he really loves. Great scene. So Socrates says, well, I don't know anything about love, but I do know what Diotima said, the priestess. And so that's how he gets his point into the symposium. It's called the ladder of love, and it's very platonic, as you might imagine. And so Diotima, the priestess, taught Socrates that, that you must climb the ladder of love. All right. Now, what does that mean? Like I said, it's very platonic. So you start with, the, with what you see, a particular beautiful body, All right, and you learn to love that beautiful body. And from loving that beautiful body, you learn to love all beautiful bodies. You recognize beauty in more than one being. All right. And then you transcend the body and learn to love the soul. And then you learn to love the laws and institutions that uphold the soul. You see what's happening here. And then you learn the beauty of knowledge itself. And then you learn the form of the beautiful. So remember, Plato is all about these forms, these perfect existences of things that on earth are pale, represent, pale mimics, copies, just poor and pale reflections of these ideal forms. So for Diotima, and therefore for Socrates, the way you love is you climb the ladder of love. But you, can't, you have to keep climbing. You can't stop at the first beautiful body. You have to keep loving all beautiful bodies and then uh, move from your body to your soul and eventually to the form of love and beauty itself. All right. From the ladder of love to the art of love. Ovid, uh, in a little book called Ars Amatoria, or The Art of Love. Really fun stuff. Uh, Ovid is Roman, so now we've gone from Greek mythologizing and philosophizing to satire and uh, playfulness. 1 BCE, three books, 57 poems. You, you may know him from his classic work, The Metamorphoses, from where we get a lot of our mythology. It's contained there. And in fact, it's here in The Art of Love as well. Um, in fact, I'm not going to read it to you, but whenever he says some of these things I'm going to read to you, he will then go long, on a long excursus explaining how all this was true in mythology. As, just as Ulysses and Penelope saw, and then he tells that story and applies these observations. Book 1, Chapter 9, How to Win Her. This is incredibly sexist. It's 1 BCE. Fair warning. 
But it's also, there's also an even-handedness here that may surprise you. Now I'll undertake to tell you what pleases her by what arts she's caught. Itself a work of highest art, the catching, that is. Whoever you are, lovers everywhere, attend with humble minds and you masses show you support me. Use your thumbs. I don't know what that means. Um, let's not think about it. First, <laughs> let faith enter in your mind. Every one of them can be one. Every one of women, you women can be one. It, you'll win her if you only set your snares. Actually, this is pretty ancient idea as love is hunting. Birds will be sooner silent in the spring, cicadas in summer, an Arcadian hound turn his back on a hare than a woman refuse a young man's flattering words. I haven't found that to be the case at all, but we'll carry on. Even she, you might think, dislikes it, will like it. Secret loves, sorry, it's 1 BCE, okay, I warned you. Secret loves just as pleasing to women as men. Men pretend badly. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Men pretend badly. She hides her desire. If it was proper for men not to be the first to ask, woman's role would be to take the part of the asker. Here's another section. Um, Okay, 1 BCE, all these things were driven by woman's lust. It's more fierce than ours. Did you know that? And more frenzied. So, on, and never hesitate in hoping for any woman. There's hardly one among them who will deny you. Again, that's not been my experience, but uh, Ovid is different. Whether they give or not, they're delighted to be asked. <laughs> And even if you fail, you'll escape unharmed. <laughs> but why fail when there's pleasure in new delights? And the more foreign, the more they capture the heart. The seeds often more fertile in foreign fields. Gross. And a neighbor's herd always has richer milk. <laughs> Let me remind you, this is one of the great poets in the history of the world. <laughs> Let your mistress's birthday be one of great terror to you. <laughs> That's a black day. When anything has to be given, however much you avoid it, she'll still win. It's a woman's skill to strip wealth from an ardent lover. <laughs> Uh, now, this is to, to men. Yeah, this is, so it's, like I said, it's kind of even-handed. So men, this is for you from 1 BC. E. Neatness pleases, a body tanned from exercise, a well-fitting and spotless toga is good. No stiff shoe thongs. Your buckle's free of rust. <laughs> Just saying. No sloppy feet for you. Swimming in loose hide. Don't mar your neat hair with an evil haircut. <laughs> you ever had an evil haircut? I think I have. Let an expert hand trim your head and beard. And no long nails, Charlie. Make sure they're dirt free for once. And no hairs, no hairs, please, sprouting from your nostrils. I'm sorry, I can't. No hairs, please, sprouting from your nostrils. No bad breath exhaled from unwholesome mouth. All right, we can agree on that. Don't offend the nose like a herdsman or his flock. Leave the rest for impudent women to do, or whoever's the sort of man who needs a man. Ouch. Yeah. Don't ask about her age. Don't ask how old she is or who was consul when she was born, because then you could figure out her age. That's strictly the censor's duty. Oh, God, especially if she's past bloom and the good time's gone. <laughs> oh, God, and now she plucks the odd gray hair. There's value, oh youth in this or a greater age. 
This will bear seed. This is a field to sow. Besides, they've more knowledge of the theme and have that practice that alone makes the artist. With elegance, they repair the marks of time and take good care that they don't appear old. As you wish, they'll perform in a thousand positions. No paintings ever contrived to show more ways. They don't have to be aroused to pleasure. Man and woman equally deliver what delights. I hate sex that doesn't provide release for both. That's why the touch of boys is less desirable. I hate a girl who gives because she has to and arid herself thinks only of her spinning. Pleasure's no joy to me that's given out of duty. Let no girl be dutiful to me. Almost done. Be modest in laughter and movement. If your teeth are blackened, large, or not in line, laughing would be a fatal error. <laughs> To have been taught more is shameful. Uh, he's gone on a section about how to have sex, and it should be within a certain lane, I guess. To have been taught more is shameful, but kindly Venus said, what is shameful is my particular concern. Let each girl know herself, adopt a reliable posture for her body. When layouts not suitable for all, she who's known for her face, let her face be upwards. Let her back be seen, whose back delights. Okay, Ovid. From Ovid, we go to God is love. Silence, okay. I'll give you a minute to catch up. Going into Christianity. This is actually a pretty amazing thing. It's the only major religion that puts love at the center of its conceptual life, um, that, God is, that God's nature is love. We know Zeus as a god of power and a god of mind. We know uh, Brahman as a god of oneness. Uh, we know Shiva as a god of creation and destruction. We know various other gods as creators or creatrixes, but God is love. God is love. Not God loves, but God is love. This is pretty amazing. This is 1 John from the New Testament. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. And then here's your passage, Charlie. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels, but I do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging clanging symbol. I'm not going to read that because you've been to enough weddings. I think you know what it says. So again, a unique thing in the world to make a God out of love. Now, how does that work exactly? With some difficulty, right? So uh, this is St. Augustine on this notion, one of the great church fathers. And here's how he puts it. This is how the love of God is shown among us. That's a quote from the New Testament. The reason why the writer exhorts us, Augustine says, is so that we may come to love God. Okay, with you so far. Could we love him unless he first loved us? Though we were slow to love, let us not be slow to love in return. He loved us first. We do not even love in the same way as he. So now see, it's getting complicated. Uh, he loved the unrighteous, but he took away the unrighteousness. He loved the sick, but he visited them to make them whole. Love then is God. This, and then a quote from the New, from John, the Gospel of John. This is how the love of God is shown among us. God sent his only son into the world that we may live through him. No one can have a greater love than this than to lay down his life for his friends. This proved Christ's love for us, the fact that he died for us. How is the Father's love for us proved by the fact that he sent his Son to die for us? Okay, notice how the Father delivered up Christ, and so did Judas. This is still Augustine. Does it not seem that they did the same sort of thing? 
God the Father and Judas. There was a delivering up by the Father, a delivering up of himself by the Son, and a delivering up by Judas. The thing done is the same. But what, it is, what is it that sets their actions apart? This. The Father and the Son did it in love, but Judas did it in betrayal. So you see that we need to consider not what a person does, but with what mind and will he does it. Why do we bless the Father and detest Judas for doing the same deed? We bless love and detest wickedness. wickedness. Okay. It's an odd kind of love that has a human sacrifice at the center of it. Okay, but yeah, you can see it. Um, but then, how do you apply that? How do you respond to that kind of love? A, a love that is given itself, its divine self, in death. What do you do? How do you respond with some kind of authenticity and integrity? Follow a set of laws? Seems kind of weak. Kierkegaard, the great Danish philosopher, stu struggled with this, uh, as did all Christian theologians. And he, uh, he, along with many others, talked about the different kinds of love, especially in the Greek language. So there's eros, which is desire, named for the god eros. There's phileo, uh, which is friendship. It's the word in Philadelphia, for example. And agape, which is, which Christians called it God's, it, because it appears in the New Testament, God's unconditional love. There's no such concept really in Greek of this total unconditional love, but Christians adopted it. Uh, let me give you Kierkegaard's voice here. As the poet understands them, love and friendship contain no ethical task. All right, so yeah, you love and friendship contain no specific ethical task. Love and friendship are good fortune. Poetically understood, and certainly the poet is an excellent judge of fortune, it is a good fortune, the highest good fortune, to fall in love, to find the one and only beloved. It is a good fortune, almost as great, to find the same in a friend. Then the highest task is to be properly grateful for one's good fortune, but the task can never be an obligation to find the beloved or to find his friend. This is out of the question. On the one hand, when one has the obligation to love his neighbor, then there is the task, the ethical task, which is the origin of all tasks. So now ethics enters the picture. Erotic love and friendship are preferential, and the passion of preference. Christian love is self-renunciation's love, and therefore trusts in this, shall. To, it shall trust in this. To exhaust these passions would make one, one's head swim, but the most passionate boundlessness of preference in excluding others is to love only the, the one and only. Um, I'm going to stop there because Kierkegaard is a little dense. Basically, Kierkegaard says that there, is, there are three stages along life's way. By the way, I stole that uh, line like I steal all my lines, stages along life's way. Um, the aesthetic. It's kind of like Diotima, the priestess. The aesthetic, the recognition of the beautiful. The ethical, which he's just talking about here, where the recognition of the beautiful requires a certain set of behaviors on your part. You must do this. If you love God, Ten Commandments. If you love me, you must do this and not do that. And then he says the final stage, the stage of the night of infinite resignation, is the stage of the leap of faith is the religious stage, which is where you transcend ethics. Love, true love, God's love, transcends ethics, which should be apparent because God sent his only son to die. Who kills his son? God does this all the time. He told Abraham to do the same thing, Genesis 22. True love for Kierkegaard, Christian love, transcends both the aesthetic, it's more than passion and, and beauty, it transcends the ethical, and you must engage in a leap of faith and be willing to kill your son if you're Abraham. Or be, you must be willing to, to do anything that God requires of you 
as you hear his voice. See, I told you this God of, as love thing, that gets really complicated. All right. Uh, you may know, know of courtly love from the Middle Ages, the troubadours. Um, it's, it was called fine love or fin amour. Uh, are you guys warm or cold? Or how are you? You good? Good? All right, good. Um, so late 11th century, um, they, they pervade this, this thing called happy wisdom, or, or it comes across in some translations as the gay science. Um, Southern France, try, they try to transform this notion of Christian love, uh, Christian ideals, into something applicable to their time and place. And so uh, it becomes this very interesting, well, let me just tell you what it is. First of all, it's aristocratic. So it was courtly love that was practiced by noble lords and ladies. It was not practiced by the peasants. Um, and so the proper place for this kind of love was in the royal court. It was ritualistic. So couples had this elaborate exchange of gifts. Uh, the lady was wooed. This is where we get this notion. Uh, courtship and courtesy, same root word. And was the constant recipient of poems, bouquets, songs, etc. Um, and all she had to do, all the courtly uh, woman in love had to do was just give some nod of approval, just some slight hint of affection. And that was it. She was kind of a goddess. She was worshipped. And so just her acknowledgement and affirmation was enough. It was secret. The courtly lovers were pledged to secrecy. Uh, in fact, that was the whole thing that got them off. Excuse me for being so <laughs> blunt. But it was the secret that made it work. Uh, so no one was supposed to know about you except you and your lover. Um, it was adulterous, uh, so it was extramarital. Marriage really had nothing to do with it, with love. Uh, we're going to talk about how that happened in a minute. In fact, one of the principal attractions of this courtly love was that it was something so other from the daily routine of medieval life that it was literally creating a new world, which is another famous definition of love by the philosopher Robert Solomon. Love is the creation of a new world, populated by two. It was very literary. Um, so it wasn't enough to be an ardent knight. You had to be able to write, create, sing. Um, tell, tell your lover a poem. Express yourself in words that were new and compelling. Um, often the love was unconsummated. Uh, that wasn't the point. Sometimes it was. But if you've ever been unhappy in love, you can blame the romantics. Um, romanticism was a reaction to the modernism of Hobbes and, and Newton and the scientific advances that made the universe go from something that was organic and living to something that was mechanical, a machine. And um, that was unsatisfying to many people, and the Romantics turned that into a movement. So I'm just, uh, just going to quote here Alain de Baton, who actually has a, some interesting works on love. Uh, in praise of love is, no, that's, I do, anyway, uh, he's not a fan of love, Alain de Baton. And he has this little piece called How the Romantics Ruined Love. So he says that it's the romantics who taught us to equate sex and love. That before that, sex was one thing. And he's right. We just saw in the troubadours this was extra different. And that's, that's often the case in world cultures, is that sex and love don't go together. Um, he, he blames the romantics for the notion that to love means you won't be lonely. I remember traveling across Europe by myself on the train and, and God, this is lonely. And then I watched the couples around me and I'm like, that's lonelier. Okay. 
Um, if you've ever thought that love should transcend practicality, oh, screw it. We're in love. Let's buy this place. Or let's go to this on this trip. Baton says the romantics are to blame for that. Because basically the romantics are pla replacing God with nature, love, feeling. That's why they're called romantics. If you ever think recklessness is a virtue, I've certainly been there. We can blame the romantics. And if you ever think your lover should not change, uh, Baton says you can blame the romantics. He has points for all of these, and, and he's right to a degree. Uh, because when you make love into a religion, you get the same problems as you get in religion, right? That re most religions don't deal well with change. Neither does love when it's a religion. All right, we're almost done. Uh, you probably don't know this French psychoanalyst, uh, Jacques Lacan. He's uh, fantastic and thoroughly French and therefore thoroughly weird um, interpreter of Freud. Uh, but really, really interesting stuff. So I just want to give you a taste of what he says. He would do these seminars, famous seminars, and his students would take notes and he would lecture. One of them's on uh, Edgar Allan Poe's um, The Purloined Letter. There's a whole seminar on this that's incredible and fantastic. But he has a seminar on, seminar eight on transference. Now, if, you're, if you've been in therapy or if you're a therapist, you know what transference is. It's where the patient or the the counselor transfers his or her feelings to vice versa, the other person. So here's what Lacan says. He says, imagine you see in front of you a beautiful flower or a ripe fruit. You reach out your hand to grab it, but at the moment you do, the flower or the fruit bursts into flames. In its place, you see another hand appear reaching back toward your own. All right, so this is what, from that image, this is what Lacan says. The suddenness or eminence or surprise marks the first appearance of love. Reflected here in the bursting into flames of the flower or fruit we reach for, that would be the same fruit, by the way, that's in the Garden of Eden. Love is presented as a mysterious and extraordinary event, arising as if from nothing. Yes, right? that's awesome. It's created ex nihilo. The relation of beauty to satisfaction. The flower or the fruit could be taken to represent the object of beauty, of course. Their anticipated taste or scent satisfaction. This opens the way to the distinction between the object of desire and the object of his drive. Misplaced objects, right? Uh, you think this object, it's like the infant with the thumb and the nipple. It doesn't matter, it feels the same, but one's going to give you what you're looking for and one isn't. How much in love that reach exceeds the grasp? Just as the flame bursts forth the moment we reach for the object, whatever medium we use to reach, words, music, images, the loved one always seems to fall short of the experience of love itself. And then finally, the narcissistic dimension of love. Another hand appears, a mirror of our own. What we were really loving was ourselves. Ouch. Roland Barthes, our old friend from Meanings of America, uh, had, he, I talked about his book Mythologies a lot and his theory of myth. He also has an, an amazing little book called A Lover's Discourse, Fragments. I love this. Um, and I just want to read you a few things from it uh, because it's, it's told from the point of view of a person, a man, in love. And he goes through the various psychopathologies of love. So li listen to this. Am I in love? Yes, since I am waiting. The other one never waits. Sometimes I want to play the part of the one who doesn't wait. I try to busy myself elsewhere to arrive late, but I always lose this game. Whatever I do, I find myself there with nothing to do, punctual, even ahead of time. The lover's fatal identity is precisely this. 
I am the one who waits. The first thing we love is a scene. I think this is really interesting. The first thing we love is a scene, not the lover. Love at first sight requires the very sign of its suddenness. And of all things, it is the scene which seems to, it, which seems to be seen best for the first time. A curtain parts and what had not yet ever been seen is devoured by the eyes. The scene consecrates the object. I am going to love. So the love at first sight idea is about a particular place in time. Not just a person, but the whole scene, right? I think that works really well. He says the context is the constellation of elements harmoniously arranged that encompass the experience of the amorous subject. Oh, I love this. You ever tried to write about love? Yeah. Worst writing in the history of the planet. To try to write love is to confront the muck of language. That region of hysteria where language is both too much and too little. Excessive and impoverished by the codes on which love diminishes and levels it. All right, and then just this final one, language is a skin. Language is a skin, I rub my language against the other. It is as if I had words instead of fingers, or fingers at the tip of my words. My language trembles with desire. The emotion derives from a double contact. On the one hand, a whole activity of discourse, words, discreetly, indirectly focuses upon a single signified, which is, I desire you, and releases, nourishes, ramifies it to the point of explosion. Language experiences orgasm upon touching itself. On the other hand, I enwrap the other in my words. I caress, brush against, talk up this contact. I extend myself to make commentary to which I submit the relation will endure. There's a really, this last philosopher, um, Elaine Badu, I really like, I, I'm just coming to him, but he's really interesting. Uh, this is his book, In Praise of Love, which is a really short book. It's really just an interview, but really interesting stuff. I like what he has to say here, and it's, I've never seen any other philosopher say this. Let me just give you a sense of what he says. Love is about two, not one. What kind of world does one see when one experiences it from the point of view of two and not one. And this, again, is in praise of love. What is the world like when it's experienced, developed, and lived from the point of view of difference and not identity? We've been talking about over a year for this, this idea in our talks and discussions and lectures here. Let me say it again. What is the world like when it's experienced, developed, and lived from the point of view of difference and not identity? From the point of view of incorporating difference, or not even incorporating, just experiencing difference, recognizing difference, as opposed to trying to make the world reflect you alone. That may be the secret of all wisdom. I don't know. Um, that is what I believe love to be. The ultimate revenge of one over two. Um, Okay, let me just read you one more so we can keep moving. What is universal is that all love suggests a new experience of truth about what it is to be two and not one. Isn't that it? Isn't that it? That it's not just me and what's in my head. That there's another person that has a whole other world, a whole other head with ideas in it, and somehow we meet, and my world is consummated in that process. I should let the philosopher speak, sorry. Um, what is universal is that all love suggests a new experience of truth about what it is to be two and not one, that we can encounter and experience the world other than through a solitary consciousness. Oh God, don't we get sick of that solitary consciousness? Or I do. Any love whatsoever gives us new evidence of this, and that is why we like to love. As St. Augustine says, we like to love, but we also like others to love us. Quite simply, because we love truth. That is what gives philosophy its meaning. People like truths, even when they don't know 
that they like them. Nice. All right. If you don't know Diane Ackerman's A Natural History of Love, you should get it. It is possibly the best book on love I've ever read. Um, and let me just give you a taste of it as we close up. Love is the great intangible. In our nightmares, we can create beasts out of pure emotion. Hate stalks the streets with dripping fangs. Fear flies down narrow alleyways on leather wings. And jealousy spins sticky webs across the sky. In daydreams, we can maneuver with poise, foiling an opponent, scoring high on fields of glory while crowds cheer, cutting fast to the heart of an adventure. But what dream state is love? Frantic and serene, vigilant and calm, wrung out and fortified, explosive and sedate, love commands an army of moods. Hoping for victory, limping from the latest skirmish, lovers enter the arena once again. Sitting still, we are as daring as gladiators. And again, love is the white light of emotion. It includes many feelings, out of which laziness and confusion, uh, which out of laziness and confusion, we crowd into one simple word. Art is the prism that sets them free. Then follows the gyrations of one or a few. When art separates this thick tangle of feelings, love bears its bones. It cannot be measured or mapped. Everyone admits that love is wonderful and necessary, yet no one can agree on what it is. If you don't know this novel, Julian Barnes, you should get it. A History of the World in Ten and a Half Chapters, one of my favorite books of all time. And that's the wrong quote there. Oh, no, it isn't. Okay. Um, ten and a half chapters, it's a retell, it is a history of the world. It begins with a retelling of Noah's Ark, and it ends with a version of heaven. And in between is the history of the world in these little vignettes. Ten and a half chapters, because the half chapter is love. If we look at the history of the world, he says, it seems surprising that love is included. It's an excrescence. Uh, a monstrosity, some tardy addition to the agenda. It reminds me of those half houses, which according to the normal criteria of map reading shouldn't exist. The other week I went to this North American address, 2041 and a half Yong Street. The owner of 2041 must have at some point put up a little plot and this half numbered, half acknowledged house was put up. And yet people can live in such a house and quite comfortably call it home. Tertullian said of Christian belief that it was true because it was impossible. Perhaps love is essential because it's unnecessary. Love and truth, that's the vital connection. See, we saw that again. Love and truth. Have you ever told much, so much truth as when you were first in love? Have you ever seen the world so clearly? Love makes us see truth, makes it our duty to tell the truth. Lying in bed. Listen to the undertow of warning in that phrase. Lying in bed, we tell the truth. It sounds like a paradoxical, paradoxical sentence from a first year philosophy primer, but it's more and less than that. It's a description of our moral duty. Don't roll that eyeball. Give a tattering groan. Fake that orgasm. Tell the truth with your body, even if, especially if, that truth is not melodramatic. Bed is one of the prime places where you can lie without getting caught, where you can holler and grunt in the dark and later boast about your performance. Sex is an acting. Sex is about truth. How you cuddle in the dark governs how you see the history of the world. It's as simple as that. We shouldn't talk about love without Pablo Neruda, but I'm just going to say Pablo Neruda. If you don't know Pablo Neruda, you must read the Chilean poet. And I'm going to end here with one of the great love poems that no one knows about by one of the great poets that is, should be known more about, Sharon Olds. Topography. After we flew across the country, we got in bed, laid our bodies delicately together like maps laid face to face. 
east to west, my San Francisco against your New York, your Fire Island against my Sonoma, my New Orleans deep in your Texas, your Idaho bright on my Great Lakes, my Kansas burning against your Kansas, your Kansas burning against my Kansas, your Eastern Standard Time pressing into my Pacific time, my mountain time beating against your central time, your sun rising swiftly from the right, my sun rising swiftly from the left, your moon rising slowly from the left, my moon rising slowly from the right, until all four bodies of the sky burn above us, sealing us together, all our cities, twin cities, all our states united, one nation, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you.